All right, and then it's still letting me share, so I'm good. Okay. Well, that looks great. So Jan's, as everybody's kind of getting logged on, Jan's putting some stuff into the chat. Um, the, um, as what we've done in the past, uh, for those of you who are joining us, that as we have questions that come up, um, we'll have you put them into the chat and one of us will be presenting and one will be kind of looking at the chat box to see questions that come up. Um, We'll record this, so if you want to get a go back and listen, um, that's fine, um, and then we'll send it out. Uh, I'm working on a central location for all of this, uh, for the content to live on, like a website that you can log into um, if you want to, and then you can go back and hopefully make the videos a little bit more clear uh, in terms of broken down so that there's not so much stuff around them. So I'm working on some editing, working on a website, and um, hopefully that'll eventually kind of house a lot of the content that we have. I think I'll have an ability to have a, a link on there if you want to sign in or I'll, um, get access through that um, login, that will be an option as well. So hopefully that'll be helpful. And tonight we're going to hit Liz Frank, um, midfoot fracture dislocations and um, I think we're going to maybe touch on some fifth metatarsal fractures if we have time, uh, depending on how things are going. All right, should we get started, uh, Nick? I know it's uh, just a couple more minutes or? Yeah, I think so. I think we can go ahead and get started. All right, so hey, can you see my laser pointer? I can. Awesome, okay, we're going more high tech now. Yeah. So hey, good evening, everybody. So, you know, Nick kind of gave a little intro here. Um, we've been doing this now a couple of times and this talks, uh, or we're gonna do a couple of cases on Liz Frank and I think uh, Jones fracture as well, right, Nick? That's right. It, hopefully we can get to Jones. If not, we'll do it another time, but um, plan is to try to do some Jones fractures. Great. So, you know, and, and, and once again, I encourage everyone in the chat, in the chat box, Nick, if you can kind of, I have it closed right now so I can see. I have screen. it open. I have Perfect. It open. So Nick, if you can, you know, stop me at any time or, you know, ask questions and, and so forth. So, and I encourage everybody to use that chat uh, feature as well. So, when we talk about Liz Franks, I mean, it's a huge spectrum of injuries here. And, and you guys are probably seeing this in the OR where sometimes you see someone just put a screw, sometimes use like an internal brace, tightrope kind of device uh, versus a big, you know, fusion, plate, staples, et cetera. And you can kind of see here the spectrum of injury. On the left, you have a standing AP. And that means like the x-ray is taking, going down and looking directly at the foot. And when we talk about the Liz Frank, you can see my laser pointer here, how the space between the first and the second is much wider on the right than the left. And this one's pretty obvious. Um, sometimes it can be pretty subtle where you, you have minimal widening, uh, but this is a person weight bearing. So when they're stressing the foot, you can see that difference. And that's kind of key. And that's what we're looking for in the OR too. We're always looking for the space between the first and the second because the Liz Frank is going to be from the cuneiform, which is this bone right here, to the second metatarsal. So if that is injured, you can see this widening right here. Now, if we go to the uh, on the right side of this uh, on the screen, that's obvious, right? <clears throat> no, I mean you could drive a truck through that inner space. You don't need a stress view, and that's a much different uh, energy injury uh, than 
um, you see on the left. So when people are talking, you know, fix, fixation versus fusion, it's it's kind of hard sometimes to divide these injuries into these two groups because they're very different patients. Um, Nick, what do you think about this? Like low energy versus high energy? What what's going through your mind sometimes, or what are you looking for? Um, in terms of, you know, getting ready for the OR for this type of case or in clinic? Yeah, I mean, I think your point's well made. You know, the the image with the bilateral feet on the left, that's that's more of your, like, athletic-looking uh, Lisp rank where you see kind of that subtle, more subtle widening right where the laser pointer is. Um, but to me, these are, again, like you said, very different injuries, um, and I'm going to approach them quite, quite differently. Um, when I look at the high energy, I'm thinking, you know, it's a lot more thought on soft tissue respect um, in terms of swelling. These will swell and blister for a long period of time. Um, but as you can see on that, that image there on the right, um, you know, you can't, it's hard to leave it like that too and expect that that swelling is going to come down in any short fashion or the skin's going to be compromised on the medial side. Um, yeah. So those are, I, I, those are kind of my initial thoughts on, on an image like that. Um, where Jan's pointing there, you see how that whole foot's abducted and um, is really exposing that that, med that that threatened medial skin. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a great point there, uh, Nick, because that, that's the tension side of the wound uh, or tension side of the foot in this type of injury pattern. So it's just like when we see a tension based um, ankle fracture dislocation on the on the medial side, you're going to see you know potentially um, you know threatened skin and so forth. So um, I agree with you. Like the, the soft tissue uh, injury here is more that comes to mind than the bony injury almost for this type of injury. Yeah, and one of the, the questions that was put in here was, uh, you know, uh, why would you choose uh, screw plate, screw fixation uh, as opposed to like a button construct or a semi semi rigid or uh, uh, tight rope? Um, like, how are you, why would you use one versus the other? Yeah, gr great question. So I think, you know, it depends on the instability that you notice. So like on the right, if someone used a suture button, um, I would say that I, I hope they would never do that. Uh, and the image on the right where you see this amount of, you know, displacement. Yeah, and you know what I'm thinking when, if I, if I saw that, that's, there's a great quote from the great lyricist Taylor Swift, which says band-aids don't fix bullet holes. <laughs> and I think that would be applicable in that situation. I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, but I'll add that to the list. I'll put it on your OR list on your Spotify. Um, so yeah, if there's like minimal widening right like this, I think it would be reasonable to use, uh, you know, some type of internal brace or flexible fixation. Um, I've used that a couple times and I've been successful with it. But I think in many of my patients, it is, um, you're not seeing... I don't see that type of patient population. So it, I think that's in a very select patient, but you could use the screw as well. And this would be like an ideal for a screw uh, potentially, or a flexible fixation, which is displacement in one plane. Um, and because it, it, you know, just in the Corona plane, so the AP that we can just see that, that widening, but <clears throat> I'm not a huge fan of just single fixation for Liz Franks. I think that's a very unique um, injury pattern that I see at least. Yeah, and I would I would agree with that. I do use that a fair bit, but I think maybe a little different patient population. I will say that if I'm using um, like the tightrope or the juggernaut, what I will do is now I have kind of a little more of a protocol where when I take them to the OR, I'll stress them under fluoro to try to understand that pattern a little bit better. And if I start to see instability of that first tarsal metatarsal joint in particular, like if I see that that joint gapping at the TMT right there, then I'm, I, I'll still use that, but on the top, I'll do a bridge plate instead and oh, something to bridge nice. plate on and then put the brace underneath it. And then the idea, especially like in an athlete, then I'll take, I'll come back and I'll take that plate out at like three months, but still a little more confident that I have something underneath there, you know, holding it. Um, and then kind of just let them go after that. I like that. I like that little hybrid construct, little hybrid construct, but it is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a game of Tetris as you think about putting your plate in, putting your screws in, and then leaving paths for, you know, to place your, um, to place your suture device underneath it. 
Great. So here, I'm going to move on to the next slide here. Oh, here. So this is a case, 63-year-old female um, and, you know, uh, involved in a motor vehicle accident, has some midfoot pain. And, you know, these are just, you know, a couple of the, you know, x-ray views. We call it, this is the, the far left. Um, this is the AP view. Okay. So once again, we're looking straight at the foot. Here's this an oblique view. You can kind of see that the foot is turned or at least the x-ray images. Um, and then obviously on the right here, we have the lateral image. And Nick, can you just go with me when you're looking at a AP, what do you kind of, how are you assessing the Liz Frank here? Yeah, as I look at the AP, I'm looking at um, the alignment of the first metatarsal relative to the medial cuneiform. And then I'm looking at the, the lateral, sorry, the medial portion of the second metatarsal and how that lines up with the middle cuneiform. Um, yeah. That's kind of what I'm going to first. I found, Jan, one of the, my first presentations on OTS was on Liz Franks. And um, I had this article I pulled up called the ABCs of foot x-rays. I'm going to put the link in the chat because it's an open, um, open text or whatever, open access. But it's yeah. a three-page document that goes through the ways to look at it. But it goes over exactly what Jan's talking about here, the, the alignment, the bones, the congruity. And I'll put the link in here so you can, can look at that. And you can have it on your phone if you're ever in the OR looking at what kind of things we're looking at in the OR. I'll see if I can figure out how to put that in there. Yeah, and then on the oblique view, what I'm looking at, you know, to go exactly what, he, what uh, Nick talked about is the alignment of the you know, th like tarsal metatarsal joint. So I'm looking at the third joint here specifically. I'm also looking at the fourth, you know, matching up with the cuboid. Um, sorry, my hands don't, <laughs> can't, it's hard to draw on the screen, but they should be aligned. And if they're stepped off at all, you need to, you know, really be suspicious of an injury. And we're using those same views in the OR. So when we assess our reduction, obviously it would be a fluoro view, but that's what we're looking for. We're looking at how the, tarsal metatarsal joints line up on the AP, on the oblique. And then on the lateral, what we're looking for is that also that, for, you know, usually it's going to be like the first or second TMT that you don't see any TMT joint or, or a, whether it be a, usually it's going to be a, met, a metatarsal, more dorsal. So dorsal means towards the top than any other. So if, so if a bone is sticking up here, that means there's instability as well. Um, and that's what we're looking for. Also, it's harder to see on the lateral view in the OR because we're putting plates or implants. Uh, but especially if you're doing something percutaneous, like a flexible fixation juggernaut or any of those things uh, that Nick mentioned, you really want to assess the lateral very closely in the operating room. Anything else, Nick, that you can see about these three images? Just no, I think that you're hitting all the all the right things. Again, the alignment and then looking at the bones and then looking at the congruency of the joints. I guess that might be the only other thing I would add is as you're looking at the um, the articulation between the, the base of the metatarsal and the cuneiform, for example, or I guess here you can see it really well. Go over to that oblique view, uh, Jan, where you're looking at four and five um, and you're just kind of looking at that, that that looks nice and congruent through there. Um, so you're kind of looking at that and that's a little bit how I judge what my oblique x-ray looks like too, uh, to making sure that I'm, I'm getting a good view of the joint surfaces in the OR. Yeah. So that, you know, it's interesting. So they, they read these x-rays as totally a negative, which is, um, or unremarkable, which I think we see that a lot with Liz Franks about 20 to 30 in some studies up to 40% of Liz Franks are initially missed on x-rays and, it, a lot of it has to do is because remember the, the x-rays such as this, they're not weight bearing, they're not dynamic. And so, you, you know, you can't see the widening necessarily. So this patient, for example, went to the ER after a car accident, you know, has some foot pain. They're like, oh, you bruised your foot, continue to walk on it. They continue to have pain. And so three weeks later, they actually presented to clinic. And Nick, what do you, what do you see here you, on the you know, maybe in the AP and oblique views, what are you noticing? Uh, it's more subtle on the AP, but on the oblique, you look at the base of the second, it looks like there's a fracture there. Um, that, that third looks like it's a little subluxed. Um, I don't see too much on the lateral. And then 
On the AP, it looks like you're maybe that base of the second is a little bit laterally translated relative to the to that uh, middle cuneiform. It's not a great view, but yeah, it looks yeah. like there's a little bit of translation. It's subtle, and I guess you know, I guess when the patient comes comes and sees you at three weeks and they still have pain, then you're kind of you know, <laughs> you're. you're you're expecting maybe something was missed too, right? I mean, so we have like, you know, kind of, uh, we're looking at through a different lens that I would say they they would in the ER. This story is so incredibly common. And that's, you know, for those of you in the OR, you, you may be seeing some of these um, in a little more delayed fashion. And that's why, because it takes um, uh, like an educated look to really pick up these subtle nuances on the, uh, on the x-rays. And I've even had cases where there's widening and the radiologist is looking at the x-rays and calls them normal. And there's an MRI as well showing a Lisfranc frank disruption and they'll still read the x-rays as normal. Um, and so the point being is that we have a, a pretty big advantage at being able to say, you know, to look at the patient, see where they're having pain. Um, there was a, Jan, there was this great question that popped up. I don't remember if it was an ortho bullets question or not, but I love the question because it showed a patient, you know, sitting in your exam room with, a bruising on the bottom of his foot and then a yeah. negative ankle x-ray. And, um, you know, the question stem said, you know, what do you, con what structure are you concerned about injury, you know, being injured? And the answer is the Liz Frank complex. And I love that question because you really, if you start to see that physical exam finding, and, and I realize a lot of you maybe aren't in the clinic, but, but get, again, getting to the point that these oftentimes get missed, um, the, if you see plantar bruising in the foot, you really, really need to think about a Liz Frank injury or a yeah. plantar fascial rupture, but most likely yeah. a Liz Frank. Absolutely. I think it's, it's a Liz Frank until proven otherwise, I would say. Um, so next steps, you know, we we'll just go ahead. So yeah, you mentioned that this is actually from that ortho bullets question. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, you can get that plantar ecchymosis and this is what um, Nick was talking about. So that bruising, you don't see that on day one, though. You're not going to see that initially. You'll see that later on when the, you know, when the bruising kind of uh, starts to show. Um, but, you know, the patient's going to, you know, have some swelling, the plantar ecchymosis, as we talked about. They talk about a gap sign. I've seen that once. Actually, it was pretty impressive on a patient who was delayed. Um, and the gap sign would be just in between the toes. The toes are kind of spread apart um the first and second toe so i don't I, but i've only seen that once on physical examination um and it was for more of a chronic injury that um that picture you have there you know that's the deformity they get where they're getting that first tmt subluxing i was talking before about assessing them in the or and that that's where you start to get that delayed that kind of more late presentation where the tmt joint of the first in particular is starting to kind of drift and, and that's a pretty marked physical exam there but even sometimes some early early on you can start to see the deformity developing yeah and they have a loss of their arch face i mean basically the patients will say they've lost their arch yeah. so you know nick i I'm just curious what you do i mean you, you usually get an mri in these are you getting ct are you just taking them to the or doing an eua um, um, it depends a little bit on what I'm dealing with. Okay. So if you go back to that, you don't have to go back, but if you take that first case, those two side-by-side -side pictures, the one that had like just a subtle widening, I'm probably getting an MRI on that, that, you know, that in that, that case, I'm looking at the first TMT joint. I'm looking to see if there's any other very subtle fractures or changes to the joint. Um, the one that was more, uh, of a high energy Liz Frank, I would say I'm getting a CT scan on those. And then sometimes it depends on what they come with. Sometimes they'll come with a CT or an MRI. Um, if those of you who have um, access or see uh, weight-bearing CT scans, those are really great options to use as well for these, I think, especially in the more kind of delayed, uh, subtle injuries. I think that's a really beneficial tool. Yeah, and I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, it's hard for me sometimes, unless it's subtle, I'll get an MRI, but otherwise I'm, I'm more of a fan of a CT. I'm yeah. just used to, I think, looking at it, mm -hmm. but you were right. You know, uh, Nick, you picked up on everything on the, <laughs> on the plane films, but you can see here, this is the CT of that patient where the first TMT is off, which was pretty subtle on the, and the first TMT is the first tarsal metatarsal joint. You can see how it's not congruent here. 
Um, you can also see here on the second tarsometatarsal joint, just the, the fracture, uh, and this is on the coronal view. When we see the axials, that's that same area that we're looking at here. So you can see, um, and, you know, just a lot of comminution at the base of the second. And here, uh, I point this out because on the, on the sagittal view, you know, I always look at this too. And you can see how just that this metatarsal is ever so slightly, you know, dorsal, dorsally su subluxed when compared to the, the cuneiform. And that just shows there's a lot of instability in this foot right now. I think... Uh, you have to remember too, it's a little bit like a pelvis, right? It's, it's hard, you know, it's very rare to see just one, like just the first TMT joint subluxed a little bit. And if you start to see that, there usually is other injuries down the chain that is gonna allow that to move that much. So if you start to see a fracture on an X-ray, chances are very high that you're gonna have more injury on the CT scan, um, as you can see in this case. Yeah. Yeah, so here briefly, we talked about it. You know, most of these are, many of these are initially missed. 20%, that's high. <clears throat> so high index of suspicion. You know, you can see here, this is where there's widening. It's, it's great to compare one side to the other. And I've sometimes done that in the OR, you know, when fixing it, like not only a Liz Frank necessarily, but like a synosmotic injury and so forth. So um, we use contralateral films all the time. And I would really suggest if there's ever, you know, if you're in the OR and something doesn't look right, you know, make that suggestion like, hey, uh, did you want to, you want to get an x-ray of the other side? I, I think that can be very helpful because sometimes in the heat of the battle, we forget. And then someone's like, hey, look at the other side. And you're like, oh, good point. <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> best way to about. do that is to have it before you start. Because then you yes. get it, it's hard to get an x-ray once you're all draped and such. But um, I totally agree. Every time I've had a contralateral x-ray, I've always been very, very thankful um, to have it. Yeah. And here, once again, you know, we talked about misdiagnosis, instability, arthritis, they get like a valgus, you know, basically a flat foot deformity. And, you know, once again, just compare the two sides, right? You can kind of see here how there's widening. There's a fracture of the base of the second and then of the third when compared to the left. And these x-rays on the right were also read as negative initially. And I, and I think the point here is you know, take a lot of time when you're in the OR, um, looking at all the x-rays um, as best you can. And, and I think this is one of those cases where the more x-rays you get a chance to look at, the more you'll be able to master looking at x-rays and understanding what looks normal, what looks abnormal, and picking up on a lot of those subtle, subtle changes. Yeah. And we talked about the standard foot x-ray. You know, Nick went over what he looks at for the different tarsal metatarsal joints. So for the, you know, AP, we're looking at the medial side of the first metatarsal and then the uh, medial cuneiform. We're also looking at then at the second TMT joint as well, looking at the second metatarsal, how it's lining up. Um, on the oblique view, so that's a turning of the foot or turning of the x-ray, depending on how you look at it. We're looking at the third, you know, the medial side of the third tarsal metatarsal joint as well as the fourth tarsal metatarsal joint, how it lines up with the cuboid. So, you know, kind of just, that's what we're kind of assessing always on the x-ray um, and looking for ways to how to improve that, our reduction in the operating room. And the dorsal view, or, you know, on the lateral view, once again, we're just looking at if anything's dorsally, dorsally displaced. Um, it's pretty obvious on the right side. Not, so, you know, on the left, you know, obviously that, that's, there's no injury there, but on the right side, that's, that's obvious. So it's like, it's one of those, you know, Liz Frank injuries where you're like, well, yeah, that's a no brainer. Uh, but it can be very subtle sometimes as some of the other images showed. Mechanism, um, you know, we see this in, you know, I see this from MBAs. I don't know if it, Nick, Nick does a lot more sports. So he might see this more in the athlete. Um, I do sometimes occasionally see it in like in soccer players as well. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, fairly, um, I think, common in high speed motor vehicle accidents and, and so forth. And, you know, especially with the displaced ones that are high energy. I don't know, Nick, do you have any comment about the mechanism or? No, not really. I think, you know, what you said all, all you know, kind of fits. I've, I've seen a number, you know, it's in football, sometimes it doesn't always, the mechanism doesn't always make sense. You know, that's the, 
the picture that you show above is kind of what we always talk about, but I've seen some kind of bizarre presentations of almost like a non-contact. Um, and, and there's a lot out there too, talking about turf um, and cleats and you know field turf versus natural, natural grass. Um, and, and so that, you know, I think that can play a role role as well. Yeah. And so then we talk about like tr different treatment options. So, you know, I'm curious. So Nick, what, what's your go-to? I mean, obviously we, we, we showed one that was, uh, you know, fairly, you know, in the beginning of the presentation that was high energy. I think that's a different beast and that's a different category, but when they're like lower energy, are you a, you know, fixer? Are you a fuser? Like how, how do you decide? And what and how are you doing it? I don't know. I was thinking about this earlier as we were getting ready. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't know if I have a great algorithm. Um, you know, in terms of uh, decide like for like an athlete, I'm I'm probably fixing them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm 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 probably not going to be fusing anybody unless you know there would be an example where they just had severe arthritis or bad cartilage injury, but that's not something that we commonly see. Um, and when I see, I would say I've probably leaned towards the, in the higher energy that even the ones that are just these kind of acute ligamentous, I really am most likely going to be fusing a lot of these. <coughs> and, um, part of it is, um, I've kind of swung back and forth, you know, that, and that's kind of the interesting thing as you go through practice, when I first came out you know, out of training, I was, you know, hundred percent, I got to fuse everything, not everything, but you know what I mean? And then I kind of went through a stage where I started fixing more of them. And part of it was, I wasn't convinced that I was getting the reductions right when I was doing the fusion. And that going through that stage um, was actually really valuable for me to really see where the articular cartilage is, to understand what that anatomy should look like. Um, and now I think I've swung back a little bit more towards much more likely to fuse if I think that um, there is like that case that you have up there, I, I think I most likely would fuse that case depending on what the CT or MRI uh, ended up looking like. How about you? Yeah, I go back and forth too. <laughs> so, um, you know, if there's a um, higher energy when there's like a lot of comminution actually throughout the entire midfoot, I tend to fix it and not fuse it because I think it's very hard to fuse and compress um, when there's multiple fragments and, and a combinated injury. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I, I, I think people can shorten the metatarsal too much and that leads to problems later on. Um, so, you know, I go back and forth. I, I think when they're, when they're like a chronic Liz Frank and they come to me at, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, I fuse them. I don't think fixing them, but like if they're acute, you know, many times I'll fix them and I, you know, I, and I'll leave, you know, this is another question, you know, do you leave your hardware in if you fix it or you take it out? I take it out. I mean, unless I'm doing something that's more flexible, but I'm, I'm definitely much more, if I fix it, I've kind of tried to adhere to the principle, then I'm, I'm removing the hardware. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think you're hundred percent right. Your point I think is well made. Um, that if there is a lot of comminution and you can really shorten that medial side a lot and, and you're already, it, it can be hard to get those joints prepped without severely shortening them. So maintaining some length, I think has some value that, and um, on some of the ones that I fused early on, I ended up making the first metatarsal too straight. I keep saying too straight, but too um, adducted. And, and that really threw off the whole gate and that really didn't accomplish anything. That was just like the worst of all worlds because um, now I fused him almost flat. And so going through that fixing stage really helped me understand where that articular cartilage is. And now I think when I go to fuse, I have a lot more confidence that I'm getting that first metatarsal over, I'm restoring that alignment and I have a little more confidence in that it's going gonna, it's gonna to look right when we're all said and done. So I got a question, another question. So if you're, say if you're fixing, okay, mm -hmm. what hardware are you using? routinely <laughs> so if i'm fixing average. if i'm fixing i'm bridge plating because in in my in my mind i don't want to violate the cartilage i don't want to violate the joint as opposed so bridge plating as opposed to using screws like you know, trans articular screws that's how i that's how i tend to think about it i don't know if it's right okay. or wrong but 
How about you? What are you using in that case? If you're fixing. If I'm fixing, I'm usually bridge plating because it doesn't make sense for me to put a joint, a screw across a joint that I'm not fusing. Um, but if I'm fusing, then I use, you know, a combination of like a lag screw plate and I'll use staples as well. I've become a huge fan of staples for these yeah. things. Mm -hmm. um, not as the primary, not necessarily, um, you, know, to, you know, I've seen people use staples for like one, two and three. Uh, I have not done that, but, uh, you know, I, I do use, you know, a staple many times for, for example, the third tarsal metatarsal joint. Um, I, I, I think you just lower profile and, you know, it's fast. It, it's fast. And I think they work, right. Yeah. Um, or it may not, I think they work. The data shows that they work. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of staples for this. Yeah, I would agree. So, um, all right. Here you go. Um, so, you know, we talked about, you know, fusion or RIF. So I think we, we went over that a little bit. I think, you know, in this patient specifically, um, actually, I think I have it already set up, uh, you know, the, in this that has all this comminution, we, we noticed that, the, you know, at the base of the, uh, or the subluxation of the first and the uh, comminution of the second, you know, this is a patient that I would fuse. Delayed presentation, older. Um, I would not try to fix this. So, which uh, joints are you fusing on this one? Yeah, so I go back and forth, <laughs> and I, I fuse definitely, uh, the, or not definitely, but in this case, the first is injured, right? You can see that's moved, up, you know, moved over laterally, and then the, um, you know, right here, it's you know, we can see it kind of subluxed on the, on the medial cuneiform. And then, so I'll fuse the first and the second. I don't always fuse the third. Okay. I, and, you know, I go back and forth. What about you? Are you always fusing the third or if you- fuse More times than not, I'm doing one, two, and three. Um, but I, I wouldn't hesitate to do just one and two. I just wanted to make sure that, that I wasn't totally crazy to do just one and two. And it depends a little bit on what the third looks like. If the third looks, looks good and looks like, you know, or maybe there's a base fracture on the third, at that extra articular, I'll go ahead and just do one and two. Yeah. As long as I can compress it, okay. I guess there's in theory that if you if you need to prep three in order to compress two, maybe. Um, but most of the time, I've I've gone either way. Yeah. No, I go back and forth and 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 so forth. So now, so Jan, if you're getting into this, so if you're going to the OR and you're prepping for this case, um, talk 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 me through how you position them and what's the arm and what kind of hardware are you are you asking for on this case i tell i tell my 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 rep that i work with the same thing i tell my patients i want the whole toolbox there <laughs> uh, so, so um you know i want plates screws and then and a staple for every case like every every liz friend and, and what size plates are you are you thinking on something like this those are usually like two four plates okay using um, I don't think you need really strong or beefy plates. I mean, the, the you don't really see the plates break um, unless it's a non-union um, or you don't take out the hardware. Um, and, you know, so I'm using two, four, two, seven plates usually. And um, the, you know, I'll have, you know, my positioning, uh, I use a, you know, they're going to be supine. Many times I'll bump it. I'll do this under tourniquet most often. Where's your incision? Yeah, so my incision, I tend to make, let me see if I have a, I had a picture, I thought, oh. Um, so this is what I did here, but I'll, I'll show you where, where my incision is. I start a little bit more medial, mm -hmm. almost, um, along like the first, maybe, maybe, maybe right here where that plate is. And then if I need to make a second incision, that's where I make it over the third and the fourth, okay? So I do not go in between the first and the second. Ever? Um, no, not ever. If I'm if I'm doing like a isolated fusion of this of the first and the second or the second only, I do sometimes do that if it's a pure Liz Frank, like a pure. Um, but I tend to start more medial uh, because I the neurovascular bundles. So that means the artery and nerve are going to be here, right? Yeah, and they can be right where you're working. Yeah. So what I do is I, I operate on the medial side of that and on the lateral side of it. Yeah. 
and I, and, and that's why I make those two incisions. And, and, and so far, so I start a little bit more medial uh, than I would say traditionally I used to, I used to start between the first and the second. And now I start more, you know, a, a little bit of, you know, more away from the neurovascular bundle. You know, and I love what you did here on this case where you put that plate along the medial border to really almost pull that first metatarsal, um, you know, in a way to restore kind of that normal abduction of the first ray. And, and I think that's a little bit what I was referring to is that you have to know where the normal is, even if you're doing fusions, you got to get them right. And I think that's probably as the biggest point of anything. Um, and so I've kind of gone that run that same, uh, that same race where I start moving my incision more medial so I can get that plate over there, pull it over, and then I'll keep a pretty big skin bridge or as big, you know, four or five centimeters to the lateral side where I can actually do two and three uh, through that incision. Right. Yeah, it's amazing because I do two and three through the lateral incision and my some of my trauma partners, I mean, I, I, I train, you know, primarily for trauma and then I did foot and ankle. Um, but my trauma partners, you know, they will go between the first and the second. And when they see my incisions, they think I'm crazy, but going so medial. Yeah. Um, but- I, it's, it's a great way to go. Um, I'll, I mean, it, it's, it's nice because you leave a pretty big skin bridge. Typically the incisions heal up really well. And I, I think you get, you stay away from the neurovascular bundle. And I think mechanically it makes a lot of sense from where you can put your hardware. Yeah. And it's interesting. So, you know, we have a couple of questions here. So uh, Corey, thanks. So what, you know, why to ensure adequate skin bridge and the questions like, yeah, so you need to have at least four, I, I would say about four centimeters. Um, you know, the more, the better, but the problem is if you have a bigger skin bridge in the foot to get to where you need to go, you're usually retracting a lot then. So you can actually do more damage. Like even though the superficial incision is further away, your deep dissection is closer. And, and I think, so I, I try to strive for about four centimeters, you know, and, and some patients with bigger feet, you can have, you know, it's a bigger bridge, but some like older patients and, and you know, uh, female patients, their feet are, tend to be smaller. And, you know, your skin incisions are fairly close. I mean, I don't know, Nick, are you um, measuring any certain way? Are you doing anything special about your closure? um, with, when your incisions are closer together? I measure it, but just to make me feel either better or worse, I don't know that I do. Anything <laughs> <laughs> and then I try to adjust it a little bit just to say it, you know, five centimeters or whatever, but it ends up being between four and five centimeters, but, yeah. but typically it actually heals actually remarkably quite well. Yeah. yeah. And then are you using any of those newer devices, Nick, about the, the suture guard? I, I don't know if it's called suture guard or something. That uh, are, is it hemi guard? Maybe. Um, I haven't, but I think that's, that's uh, an attractive option in some of these, these, uh, these cases, if you're worried about skin tension. Um, yeah, I have not used it. I'm kind of curious about them. I, I, you know, I don't know what the data is. You know, I know there's been a lot more, like, I would say advertising and marketing for them. Um, but, I, you know, I'd be curious to know if they actually, if it does work and, and, and so forth. But uh I think some of these might be good cases for it, uh, you know, trauma around the ankle and the foot. I think, uh, I think the, to the point though, that these can be a real problem if you don't let the skin swelling go down. Um, and I've definitely been burned by thinking everything was okay and going in too soon and having to, you know, do wound care or hardware removal or, or whatever else they can be, they can be a pain. Um, so making sure that there's been adequate time for the swelling to go down, I think is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. Uh, there's a question on uh, systems that go fully interosseous on the first, second, and third TMT fusions. Um, I'm not familiar with that system necessarily. Is it like a, like almost like an intermediary system, Jan, do you know? I don't know. I don't know, John, if you can, can you describe it more? What, it, what are you... What are you referring to? I mean, certainly if there's something that's interosseous or intermedullary, um, that would be nice from a wound healing perspective or, or issues with, um, yes, you know, irritation that skin's so thin. Um, but I've, I haven't used uh, anything quite like that. Yeah, I've used it only like if you're using like a beam for like a shark code. Yeah. You know, if you're crossing the first TMT, but you're, you know, that goes along the entire length of the metatarsal. But yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think if you could somehow use a nail or something, I know, I know there's some lapidus um, implants now. Yep. Or like that are intraosseous. So, I mean, I, I don't see why you couldn't potentially use it for this. Posting it. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not seeing that for a Liz Frank, John. I, I know what you're talking about. I've seen that for a lapidus. Um, and for me, it makes sense. I think it's a very strong construct, but I've just never used it. I don't know if I'm not seeing it used for a Liz Frank, but I, I, and I don't know if there's a specific one for a Liz Frank, but I have seen it used for first tarsal metatarsal fusion. Um, I know like Paragon, I know has one yeah. specifically that does that. Um, Jan, talk about bone graft for a second. Are you bone grafting these? Does it depend on how far they are from the injury? Yeah. So every fusion I bone graft, um, it depends where I get the bone graft from is different. It might be different, but usually I try to take proximal tibia autograft on patients. Um, I just find it's, I mean, I think you could take the calcaneus too. I mean, but proximal tibia, I just can get as much graft as I want plenty, uh, for this type of uh, thing. I do sometimes use a biologic, uh, some of the biologics are off label in this area. So just in case the FDA uh, is watching. In case uh, they have nothing better to do in case they want to. Yeah. Miss exactly. Monday Night Football to listen to us. But um, I do use sometimes biologics. I'll use, um, I won't use BMP. I'm not using BMP for this, uh, but I have used um, Augment um, for some like non-union cases. And, you know, and like patients who are smokers, I've, some, I've sometimes used it as well. Yeah, I guess um, I'll, you know, maybe in a little bit as a contrary into that, I don't necessarily fuse or use graft in all of them. And some of these acute ones, you know, where it's, um, I feel like the trauma itself has created kind of enough of a biologic response. Yeah. I have not necessarily fused or used hardware, or if I do, it's a relatively small amount. Um, but, you know, for a more chronic kind of situation, I'm probably more likely to use um use like in this case use some sort of some sort of a bone graft for it yes yeah, and, and you know Corey mentioned your why graft for every fusion whether auto or allo or then even you know i guess asking it synthetic so i just graft like i i guess i'm more traditional if i fuse i think i need bone graft and i take bone graft for a lot of my trauma cases so I, i'm just very used to it it only adds a few minutes for me um to do in the OR and you know everybody's ready for it so I you know I, I don't see a drawback from it and then I know I've tried everything for that patient to get them to fuse um I, I think, still have unions and I still have non-unions and everything but it's just when I when I think fusion I think bone graft and and I think that um for those of you who are prepping for a case like this like whether it's a fusion or even an ORF in some cases but especially the fusions having that as your list of questions for your surgeon saying, Hey, do you want graft? What kind do you want? What can I have on the table ready to go? Honestly, that goes a long way. And then maybe just even, I don't know about for you, for, for you, Jan, as you get into the mix of a case, you start to lose track of time a little bit um, and understanding when you need to open the graft so that when you're ready for the graft, you're not waiting for it kind of deal, uh, whether yeah. it needs five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. Um, just having that kind of timetable, uh, you know, in the back of your mind as you're going through it, just to keep things, cause these can kind of linger and linger and linger. You want to kind of keep your momentum moving through the case and having stuff ready to go, having the plates kind of picked out all those kinds of things, I think really go a long way. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you mentioned synthetic, yeah, anything, like I said, that's, that, that, that's in the toolbox. Everything is, everything's available. Um, so here, you know, just, you know, a couple of the studies, you know, the, that I showed, you know, in terms of like type of bone graft and fixation type. Um, so isolated plate fixation, smoking, and non-anatomic alignment appear to significantly increase the rate of non-union. So, you know, once again, like as Nick said, you got to get these reduced. And if you get them reduced, you, um, you know, they tend to do better in terms of just their function, lining up the first uh, TMT joint, as you can see here, I think, you know, um, and the uh, second TMT joint as well. So in, I, I pay close attention to not to shorten the second TMT, yeah. second metatarsal very much. Um, 
and this is kind of, I think, key that I think some of these people miss is if you shorten this area, they could get a lot of transfers, tra uh, transfer metatarsalgia in the future. And you can see in that case, and, and again, we're being nitpicky, but like that's a little bit short, you know, and I've yeah. definitely had them look like that. And it, knock on wood, hasn't been an issue, but, um, but that, that has happened to me as well as, as you go to fix these, that second shortens a little bit more than you think. Um, you know, here you can see on this case here, this, the second's a little bit longer. Um, looks like that one you just fixed and didn't fuse or maybe yes. fuse and, a second. And this is one that like, you know, this is a, I added this because I think this is like a key image. And I think, um, especially sometimes if you're struggling in the OR, um, you know, a lot of people will put the Liz Frank screw when they're fixing it, you know, from the, they'll put it from the base of the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I and I call that like an anti-grade screw. A lot of times now I've gone through it to a retrograde yeah. where I go the opposite because I already have this area exposed at the base of the second tarsal metatarsal joint. And for me, it's a lot easier to put the screw back to the medial cuneiform. Mm -hmm. Especially and once you get that first reduced, once you get that first yes. DMT joint reduced, and then you're just bringing the second to that kind of stable construct. To me, that's always made more sense than going right. anti-grade. But okay, so this is a solid screw, it looks like. Are you using solid screws? Are you using cannulated screws? What's your preference? Is there one better yeah, all, than the other? All, all solid. Why is that? Uh, I just want a, a stronger screw. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how much it makes a difference, you know, but we know that cannulated screws at that, that the smaller the cannulated screw you use the more likely it could it could break so do you have any tips for putting you know that's that can be a daunting thing to for for some people to put solid screws in on these kind of small joints any tips for placing yeah so um what i do is that you know i drill this under fluoro and i drill it by feel so um i want to feel the four cortices so I feel the first, you know, at, at the, um, you know, at, at the second, oops, sorry. And then I feel at the base, you know, I, I kind of, I go through just as I'm passing that, you know, the drill bit, I want to feel then the medial cuneiform, the, the uh, lateral part of it, and then the more the medial part of the medial cuneiform. So, um, so yeah, one, two, three, four. And then I know I'm in bone. So I make sure that matches up with my x-ray view at that time. So if I'm hitting the, th if I counted three, I should be hitting this cortex right here. Um, and then, you know, I, I left to write these images. I'm very big on that with the CR tech. And, you know, I, I place the screw and make sure it's, it's following the same path. But um, I don't think it's that much harder. I mean, I do this all the time. So I think it's just getting practice with it. Um, but sometimes the problem is if you use a cannulated, you, you have a lot of control with the drill bit because it's, it's bigger, you know, it's usually like two, five or two, six. I usually use a three, five screw here. So you can really readjust your, um, the path of your drill bit using a, that type of drill. You can, it's very hard to readjust that your, your path with a very flimsy wire for like a three, five screw. Um, but that's how I do it. Are you a cannulated screw fan or are you no, a solid? I use solid, but I'm just curious, making sure I wasn't crazy. I've done some where I've done it like that. I've done some where I've used a cannulated system um, to place the wires and then, you know, use a can cannulated drill, but then insert a solid screw. Um, and that, that can work okay as well. Yeah. As so long as it, you just have to make sure that your drill bits are compatible if you have that some some drill bits don't aren't necessarily compatible with the size of your core diameter yeah that's a good that's a good thing too you, you can drill for a, a cannulated screw and then just put a solid screw in mm -hmm. so um you know they talk about you know it's just a study you know reoperation rate after uh either primary arthrodesis so fusion or fixation and you know basically you know, when you exclude implant removal, patients with uh, Liz Frank injuries treated with, whether you fix them uh, or you fuse them, don't have a, a higher reoperation rate. So it kind of shows as long as you do it well, whether you fuse them or you fix them, 
that you probably have the, the same long-term outcomes. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, that's a good point. Really understanding the, that's where I think it's so important to understand what normal x-rays look like, what abnormal x-rays look like, what are the things that you're looking for on the x-rays that are different from one to the next. Jan, there was a question here just a little bit back. I want to hit right now um, that talks about, that was asking what's the best way for a rep to ask to review cases before a case? And then how do you address issues or pathology that may be missed by the surgeon initially? Sounds like this rep worked with me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So I think that's great. Like, I love it when the rep calls me, um, or texts me, you know, usually like they, they, they know I like texts. So they'll text me and be like, Hey, it looks like we have something on, on Friday. Um, do you have time to look at the x-rays? They'll, they'll catch me in between cases on a different day. Um, and you know, I think that's very helpful. Um, or, you know, they'll say like, Hey, I want to make sure I have everything for your case on Friday. Um, you, you know, are you thinking you're going to fix or fuse? And like, you know, because sometimes the person who lists my case may not put the correct information down. So I find that very helpful. And then I'll tell you right now, I believe in see something, say something. I am not offended by a rep telling me about something as long as, you know, obviously we should all be respectful for to each other. Uh, but they might be like, oh yeah, you know, do you want to maybe, you know, use this type of plate? I've seen some other you know, surgeons use it in a similar injury. And it's a nice way that they can kind of tell me like, hey, you know, maybe you should consider this or not. Um, I, I think that's very helpful. Um, and you could, you know, I, I, I like it, you know, if they say, oh, yeah, I saw Dr. So and so he or she, you know, she had one the other week, and uh, she was able to, you know, put a clamp here and, and get it reduced. I don't know, have you ever thought about that? Or have you ever seen that done? I thought it was pretty neat. That's what one of my reps will say sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a be... code, right? There's, like a... <laughs> what? there's a code. It's like a yeah. code. It's like a code. Cause you don't want to be like, Hey, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? But you're like, Oh, you know, Hey, that's, that's a really interesting way to do it. Um, I don't know. Like, and I think it's like, in, for me, I'd rather the rep say something. Um, and I tell my, like, you know, the new people that I work with, see something, say something. Yeah. I, I, think, I don't know, Nick, what, how about you? Like, what, yeah, what you, it's, you know, yeah. it kind of depends on how the case is going sometimes with how uh, <laughs> yeah. responsive I, I can be. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that, that y'all are valuable members of the team and have seen a lot of cases. And so I agree with Jan that if there is something that comes up that you're like, I don't, I don't love that. Uh, you know, saying something. And if you say something and you get blown off, well then, you know, at least, you know, it's not on you. And, and, um, but there's, there is a way to say it. And it's, it's almost like when I have to like address uh, my kids' bad behavior is maybe you're treating surgeons like, like your nine-year-old or your five-year-old where you wait till they cool down and then, and then have a chat with them. Um, That can be an effective way to do it too. Um, so there's, there's different strategies. And I, and I certainly realize that I have partners that you just, it's very, it's like walking on eggshells to say something. And then I have partner, you know, there's other people out there that, you know, you could say whatever and they wouldn't care. Um, so it, it's, it's walking that tight, that tight rope a little bit. I certainly realize. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes helpful. Like if you have like a new product or new, you say new staple or, or something, you know, if you could be like, oh, yeah, hey, we have this, you know, um, maybe if someone that, that they respect that has used it, another surgeon in the area or, or something, they'd be like, hey, you know, we saw that. And, you know, Sarah Smith, you know, I was in on a case and she used this, you know, for Liz Frank. When, do you think this might be useful in your practice ever? I, I can get it here. I can show it to you. Um, because I think that's very helpful sometimes if, if I know. And, you know, sometimes I'm sure the person might be, you know, embellishing um but if they're not and they're telling you know they're saying like somebody that i respect has you know tried it uh, i'm more likely to like be like huh oh nick uses this let me, let me hear about what nick's using yeah. um i think that can be very helpful because that, that's a bit like a vote of confidence in that product you know if we know that other surgeon even if we know him indirectly and then one other thing i've been thinking a lot about and prepping for this um has been uh, if anybody's read the book, um, never split the difference by Chris Voss. I don't know if you've read that yawn or not, Yeah. but one of the things he talks about is the black swan, right? What's the thing behind the thing that helps like that you don't know. 
Uh, understanding that with surgeons, I think is extremely important as well. If you haven't read that book, you should read that book. That will, it's, it's almost a life-changing book, I think. Um, in turn, and it, I, th I would think it would be extremely valuable in dealing with surgeons in, in particular. But, um, you know, talking about the black swan, which is, you know, what you don't necessarily know that can help make or break a decision. Uh, and so I, in terms of like some of those products and things that come forward, understanding maybe who's footing the bill. Like if you come to a surgeon who is in like private practice and they're paying for all their own staff and ASC and drill bits and all the little things that matter that affect their bottom line, you have to approach that a little bit differently than coming to somebody that's in an academic or a hospital employed who doesn't really, I don't want to say they don't care, but it doesn't affect their bottom line nearly as much as somebody in those situations. So understanding those nuances, um, I think is, is going to go a long ways for you. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you there. And I, I think, you know, I, I'm also a, you know, if, if it's, um, if it makes sense, um, you know, for the patient and, and so forth, like, it, you know, and it kind of solves a problem. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, you know, as long as it causes no harm, I think it's a lot of times it's worth to try many of these things um, because, you know, we, we need to strive to get better, um, whether it be as, you know, a surgeon, as a rep or any of these things. So, um, you know, if it's something that can potentially help my patient and that's how it's presented to me, hey, we have this, yeah. you know, bone graft even, or, you know, this bone graft substitute, we, we've seen it, you know, this may, you know, you don't have to then take other, you know, bone graft from their proximal tibia. I'm, you know, I might be willing to try it because if it's helping the patient, I'm going to be like, hey, all right, let's give it a shot and see how it goes. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of there's a formula, there's a secret formula, which is, does it help me help with the problem? How easy is it going to be for me to be able to, to use it or get it or, or whatever? Um, or is there going to be a bunch, you know, a bunch of pushback or if it's going to be super expensive, like all those, like all those things kind of play in, um, into the decision-making. Yeah. Um, I can show, I know we're like running low on time here. I was going to just show just two real quick cases, just as a, as a alternative, not even as an alternative, but I'm going to just going to share my screen here real quick here. Uh, let's see if this will, here we go. Um, slide, slideshow. Um, um, so this would be just like a quick couple examples I'm going to rifle through here. You know, this is like a, this guy was in his, I think he's in his thirties, maybe early forties. I don't, I think he's late thirties, fell off of a ladder. Uh, you know, I'm going to say he was hanging Christmas lights. I don't think that is exactly what he was doing, but in the, in the spirit of the season, but, you know, if you look at this, you can see all the things that we talked about, subluxation on the lateral view, the AP, the oblique, all look funny, right? And the CT scan, hopefully this doesn't play the music in the background. Um, let's kind of scan through here real quick. But you can see some small fractures, but nothing, like mostly ligamentous injury in this case. Jan, are, looking at this, I know I'm like putting you on the spot. Are you fusing or fixing this? Uh, <clears throat> I'm probably fixing this acutely. All right. I'll sit. So I, this is my, I, fi I fused him um, right off the bat and did like decisions like you talked about. Um, so these aren't great x-rays here and here. I use like, I think these are two, four plates. I don't think I used any bone graft. But this was him at, let's see, six months, you know, and I'm pretty darn happy with the way that looks at six months, his lateral view, and he's back to work. He works on his feet. He's a manual laborer. Um, and he's, he's came back the other day and he's like, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm not having any problems. So just an example of using a, like a high energy injury, mostly ligamentous. And I think I fused him. I don't even think I used any bone graft on him. Yeah. So the other thing too, I just thought about it with you, just the equipment and the implants in the room, like could be very helpful from a, a standpoint, a rep standpoint is not only like the plates and the screws and the staples, which I, you know, you know, like I, like I said, I want the toolbox there, but everything that goes in the toolbox. So you can have, you know, small joint distractors 
you can, you know, tools to remove the cartilage from the ends of the bone, mm -hmm. ends of the joint, I mean, um, like curettes and so forth. I think that can be very helpful. There's some kits that are, you know, peel packed. There's some things that sometimes they have that, you know, in a surgeon, in a surgeon set at the actual hospital or surgery center. And then there's some companies that keep it within their set. Those tools can make it a lot easier uh, for the surgeon. So it's kind of like what Nick said, like if you can make it easy um, and reproducible, I think that's very helpful. So think about those tools too. If, you know, someone's struggling, like, Hey, how can they, how can we get them to remove the cartilage or her, uh, or her to remove the cartilage more easily from the joint? You know, if you have good curettes and everything, um, any of those things can be helpful. Uh, you know, then, you know, I'm more likely then to use that product again, uh, because if it was made easy and, and it, 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 it was good for the patient. Yeah, of course. The second time I do the case, I'll, 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 I'll want the same stuff back. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and then just one other um, example, because you talked, because you mentioned it. So kind of a similar ish case, right? Mostly ligamentous. I don't think I have the CT scan. I kind of threw this one on last minute, but fused him with that all staples. Oh man. Case. And <laughs> the rep this, loves was, this was, yeah, <laughs> this was <laughs> one case in which it was, um, it was a slog to get him reduced. And this was at six weeks. And, you know, he'll, he's, I guarantee he's been walking on it. So I'm not, you know, hundred percent confident this is all done, but I'm pretty darn happy with the way that looks at six weeks. And it was yeah. a slog to get it reduced. And it was so nice to be able to get done with that part of it and just go, shoop, 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 you know, just one staple, one state, you know, and go in and, and then, and then you're done in a matter of like 10 minutes. And so that part does, I think have some advantage because it takes a minute to get the plates in the right spot to get the, you know, screws all that stuff. There is some, there is definitely some advantage to, to staple fixation. Yeah. And I think a lot of people still don't trust it, at least in the trauma world. Um, I've seen some, you know, people use it like on a humerus and, and so forth, but yeah. you know, like my trauma partners don't use staples and then I'll use staples and so forth. And um, I, I think from an ease of use, you know, if, if you can, you know, introduce surgeons who don't use it, like one, that it's easy to use. They're very strong, these nitinol staples. Um, and it's just reproducible, right? It's two drill holes and then a staple, I think for most systems, I believe, at least the one I use. Um, I don't know, there, there's a huge advantage and, and people talk about cost, but if you put three locking plates on this with you know potentially locking screws, I, I have a feeling the cost becomes very, you know, much more competitive that way. Yeah, I think so too. You know, Jan, maybe that's a good idea as we think about this um, with all the staple systems that are coming out there and available. Maybe someday we should do one on tips and tricks for staples, uh, you know, things that we've done that work and things that we've done that haven't just to you know, improve OR efficiency and, and stuff like that. That might be a good thing to try or to talk yeah. about. The yeah. other thing that, you know, these are so strong that there was just a paper that came out showing um, uh, like non-union rates in CT yeah. scan because they're so strong, you can't actually detect that, that there's a non-union uh, in these cases, in some of these cases, which I thought was a really interesting paper um, and you know, may it lend itself to some other problems or you know, in terms of whether healing or, or whatever. Um, and then the other thing that I'll mention is taking these out can be a bear. I have run into issues. So if you have any tips, maybe we can put that in that uh, yeah. <laughs> little segment as well. Uh, and then I have one other question, Jan, um, that's been burning me is when do you add fixation into the lateral column, the fourth and fifth tarsal metatarsal joints? When do you put pins in there? Is it if it's only unstable or is it all the time or is it very rarely? Very rarely. I think when you get the first, second and third lined up, it's very rare that you need to do anything to the fourth or the fifth. I've sometimes in high energy injuries, I've pinned them. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I think that's, it's more rare. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's one out of 10. I, I mean, it's not often that I do it anymore. Yeah. I don't know. How about you? That's same. I rarely do it. I just, once you get the, the medial column reduced, most of the time, the fourth and the fifth, they line up. And then I just don't see a point in what the, that there's a point in doing any sort of fixation on the fourth and fifth. It's just another point for infection. I don't think it adds that much. And think there's somebody said they're publishing their very large case series on not doing any lateral fixation at some point out of, I think out of the UK. 
And I'm hoping that kind of backs that stuff up. I think it was Lindy. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah. I, I'm not seeing any like long-term problems from it. Um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are, but I, we, I, I've just not seen it um, specifically, so. Okay, well that, I mean, that's, we covered a lot of ground there. If there's yeah. questions that come up, please feel free to reach out. Um, like I said, I'm working on getting a website up and running that would have this all, all this content that if you wanted to get, you know, everything you needed to know about list rank injuries, uh, we can, we can definitely do that. Um, and, uh, if there's questions, feel free to reach out over email. I put our emails in the chat, um, and hopefully I got yours right, Jan. Uh, but, yeah. uh, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for joining, um, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and everything. Um, you know, hopefully you're enjoying some of this. Uh, I mean, we're just trying to, you know, teach some of the basics too. So you kind of, when you go to the OR or in clinic, you ask someone, you know, the, the surgeon about, you know, the surgical plan, you kind of have a little bit of background too. So you can be more, you know, be helpful in the OR um, as well. Cause it's, it's a team approach, right? I mean, I, I love, you know, I personally love it when my rep will say like, oh, I, I thought about, it. I brought some graphs today. <laughs> You'll notice like I need a wedge. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's a good idea. You yeah. <laughs> the um, good thing you came. <laughs> um, if if there's um, topics you all would like to, as we kind of have been getting into this, if there's topics you all would like us to go through, um, feel free to reach out and um, uh, you know hit, hit us up, and we can we can talk, see if we can find some cases um, or find someone that does uh, as it as we get going. Yeah. And then Thanks. we'll look at um, early January for the next one. I'm hoping we can do it around that time. Yeah. All right, guys. Happy holidays. Take care. Thanks for joining, everybody. Bye.